Sorry about that. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction to who we are here at Clearview, we're a Washington DC based research firm that helps um, financial investors and corporate strategists understand how legislation, regulation and politics impacts primarily publicly traded companies. And what we try to do is, is help them understand sort of the realm of possibilities um, that could happen in order to facilitate their, uh, their decision making. We're analysts, we're not lobbyists. We don't advocate for a particular position, um, whether it's on behalf of our clients or for partisan interests. We just try to provide the sort of the realm of possibility to keep that, um, to make it easier to, to determine risk. Um, let's see, and I'll get remote control back here. And then um, I am part of a team that covers electricity, energy transportation, which includes pipelines. We also cover fuels, vehicles, and refining. Geopolitics, which has been a little exciting lately, of course, oil, natural gas, and coal, which has been like a roller coaster, power alternatives, and US policy more broadly. Um, and this is some, because we have financial institutions as our clientele, we have to disclose that there are risks, like everything that happened today could change tomorrow, which I think everyone is very sensitive to these days. So what I'd like to start with is to give you a sense of how infrastructure reviews um, are creating hurdles to infrastructure solutions. And this is part of a challenge that we see for project sponsors in the following respect, is that careful permitting, which is something I think a lot of people really feel is, is necessary and important in order to be appropriate stewards of our um, of our of our environment as well as our economy um, means that there's a lot that a project sponsor has to go through before they ever turn a shovel or put a piece of infrastructure in the ground and that ranges from the national environmental policy act clean water act at the federal level through the u.s army corps of engineers the rivers and harbors act when we cross rivers minerals and leasing act when we cross uh, federal forests and other other federal lands, the Forest Management Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, so we don't tear up the things that are um, important to us, particularly for, for tribes. Um, the Endangered Species Act, which has um, been a very prominent in uh, infrastructure issues lately, as well as the Natural Gas Act as overseen by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And if that laundry list weren't enough, there's state permitting, um, there's federal delegation of Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act permits, the delegation of Coastal Zone Management Acts, which is important for LNG export facilities, plus state level permits. And all of those permits can be challenged on judicial review. So this is something that when we go through the process of um, evaluating infrastructure needs, there is a time and component to it that is problematic when we're in the middle of an energy transition. So to talk a little bit about, I wanna give you three examples, one each from oil infrastructure, one from natural gas, and um, one from transmission lines, just to set the stage here for the conversation that's gonna continue. Um, the first is the Line 3 replacement project up in uh, the Dakotas in Minnesota. This is a line that brings um, oil down to our refineries here in the United States and the Gulf Coast. Our um, refineries moved away from light, sweet, crude, crude after the first um, big Iranian oil crisis back in the 70s and um, retooled so that they could process the heavier crude that's available in Canada and in the, uh, in the South American countries such as Venezuela. So this pipeline is old and it's at risk of leaking and what the operator Enbridge wants to do is to replace it and they want to decommission the current line and they want to recommission a new line. And the statute in Minnesota that overseas infrastructure permitting doesn't actually address the specific question of replacing infrastructure. And because the pipeline is old, it has been running lower than current capacity at about 300, 390,000 barrels a day and will be, um, when it's rebuilt at very close to its current diameter, it would actually be able to carry 760, which is what its original capability was, 760,000 barrels per day, of course. So, the question that has been um, looming here is whether or not 
this pipeline is needed as we contemplate moving into more renewable energy, as we contemplate, you know, diversifying away from oil um, because of its carbon intensity, particularly heavy oils such as those available in Canada, like from the tar sands. And so one of the real questions that's legally going to play out, even though this um, project has been re-permitted, is whether or not it's allowed to go from 390,000, 360,000 barrels a day, which is the current assets capability, to replacing like for like and being at 760 again. So this is a, an interesting conundrum of how things pass over time when the statutes themselves don't address a particular situation. There's significant litigation risk then around this project. As um, was mentioned earlier, natural gas has not been a good time. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline has been uh, stymied by uh, failures in its approval process. It was successfully certificated under the Natural Gas Act by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission back in 2017, but is only about 6% complete because it has had problems not in its FERC authorization, but in the Endangered Species Act authorizations issued by the Interior Department's Fish and Wildlife Service, flawed permitting by the Forest Service, um, which is part of the Agricultural dis, uh, Department, and a flawed permit under the, um, the Clean Water Act at, um, for the uh, 404 program in terms of the, um, uh, the Nationwide 12 permit program. So it's lost, in addition to those three key federal permits, several others that has kept it from being constructed on time. Now, construction has been stalled since December of 2017, and it's now March of 2020. And we've had an administration change in Virginia, and we've had a movement in North Carolina pushing back on the utility authorizations that were going to replace coal combustion um, generation with natural gas combustion, because in the, in the five years it has um, taken since this project was first initiated at FERC, They've decided, um, a lot of customers have decided that they want more um, renewable energy. Lastly, the New England Clean Energy Connect is a transmission line that is intending to bring Canadian hydropower down to New England. Um, it is low carbon, base load. It is a great opportunity for New England, which is very conscious about their emissions profile, to access um, nearby energy. However, the states that it will cross, in this case, in particular, Maine, have raised concerns about the greenfield component of the project. And even though the governor supports it, there has been a ballot initiative to ask the legislature to reconsider that approval. And if the legislature doesn't um, reconsider it, they're actually gonna put it to a vote in November. So this project, which has a lot of fabulous green attributes when you're looking at an objective, in New England to decarbonize uh, their power system, it's having very significant problems on the ground in terms of the landowners and the communities it actually touches. So um, with that sort of setting the table, I'll leave it there and uh, pass the baton.